basketball last night? I fell asleep and watched the ending. Incredible, yeah. Incredible. As a person who's been on that level in that stage. Well, I even told Shelly last night we were watching the beginning, all the hype and all that, and I said, you know, it's, someday I want to go back and watch the TV copies of our games. I never had, never been able to. And I just think it's so great for those young people to experience that. And boy, did they do it up, too. The pregame was unbelievable. For that. So that's, it's just great for sports, and I love watching that stuff. <clears throat> in a row there, uh, Ryan. Oh, uh, sorry. Um, yeah, uh, just looking at recruiting, it seems like over the last 10 years, anytime an Ohio kid commits to Michigan or a Michigan kid commits to Ohio State, they rarely flip back to their home state school. And I was just wondering if you had any thoughts on why that is, whether, you know, they make that decision only once they're sure they can, you know, you have to be sure about it if you commit to the I think the, you're probably right. I've never really been that thorough in thinking that through. But to, to pull that trigger and say, I'm going to go there, the heat that the young person is probably going to take, you better be right on. And I'm sure the families advise them as well. So that's very observant. I never really noticed that. But now that I'm thinking about it, you're right. And with guys like, you know, Damon Webb and Mike Weber, did, did you also recruit them harder knowing that, Michigan might still be going after them. And Mike Jordan, too. Uh, oh, sure. I mean, you, you know your competition. You know who you're going against. And, and uh, I mean, there's many more. I don't it's recruit harder. I don't recruit more thorough and understand when that kid pulls the trigger that it, he's going to take some heat. Yeah. Second row left, Bill. Urban, excuse me. Uh, you've talked about how you have receivers out, your top three guys out. Of the top four guys. Top four guys. And when we were practicing the other day, it seemed like you were maybe holding some linemen out, maybe just doing some high rep guys. But for, for JT, for a guy who's been around to sort of be in a mix with guys who maybe don't quite know right. what they're doing, it's tough. Um, do you have to preach, have extra patience for him when he's going through something like that? I don't really have to preach much of JT. He's smarter than I am. I mean, he's smarter than our staff. And I, I'm not saying that he's a very smart player. So I, I, I don't preach at him very much. He understands the big picture of everything. and. And we have the 2000 rep club, you know, where guys are played so much football that why would you put them in harm's way when, you know, Pat Elfline's just, his biggest thing is learning a new position and getting as many reps at his, to fix his weaknesses. And same with uh, Gary Ann Conley, same with Raquan McMillan, same with uh, uh, Billy Price. Those are just guys off the top of my head that played a lot of football for us. And JT obviously wants to get better too. Is it any more difficult to do yeah. that when he's surrounded by guys like that? Much more difficult, but I don't know the answer, you know, other than, once again, he, he understands the big picture of it all. Uh, second row left, Ari. Urban, um, two questions. One, this week a recruit came out and said that he did have very good experience here. And, and I don't know, you can't comment specifically on the case themselves, but when somebody comes out and says something like that. Sure I can. Uh, they're uh, signed. I, I did read it. We had a lot of respect for him as a player, a lot. I was very disappointed in our staff that we didn't offer him earlier. And uh, then about the treating him bad, that's, I, you know, we don't do that on purpose if that's his feelings that I, you know, I f went back and talked to our staff about it because we don't that, want that to be out there. But when you have one out of 650 that say that someone's treated bad, you know, but I know he, we did not offer him early. Well, we did want to offer, I mean, afterwards he really grew into a great player and I think we missed on him early on. And that was our very upset with our coaching staff, the recruiter in that area, and then the position coach. So that's the way we do our business here. So yeah, I mean, yeah, we do address that. I don't want that out there. And then I went back and... can't come out, but I've got one other recruiting question completely different. You guys recruit Ohio very hard, obviously. It's always been start here, expand out. But in some senses, is it harder for an Ohio kid to earn an Ohio State offer than it might be from a kid who's further away because you understand that you have to be careful about early commitments? I, I think that, yeah, sometimes you have to offer a guy early out of state to get in the game, and I leave that more up to the position coaches who understand that area. And if you want to get in the game, sometimes you have to answer, you know, sometimes you do that. Un, you know, I don't say it's positive or negative, but in state, you just got to be very cautious because when that offer goes out, you can't pull it. You're, you're, I mean, you're, you're in it. A lot of times and really out, out of state, if you offer a guy and he gets, you know, 50, he has gots. If he gots, if he has a bunch of other offers and you can kind of just move on in Ohio, you got to be very careful. Cause is there like a fear that in Ohio, if you offer, most sure. kids here are going to? And some schools come in and offer, you know, I can name off seven schools that offer probably about 100 players in our state. 
we can't offer 100 players in our state. And they'll come back, why did we not offer this guy? Well, we certainly think he's a fine player. We just, we're a little slower to offer. Front row right, Austin. Throughout the spring, we've seen some of your, the guys who left early, Mike Thomas, Eli Apple coming out to practice. Are you still, spring ball's almost over. Do you catch yourself wondering, trying to plug those guys in your lineup still, even though they're gone? No, no, I just, I did that on January when they told me they're leaving. Kind of went through a little withdrawal, but no, it's that that ship has sailed. And and the good thing is they're really helping our young guys. You know, I watch them. You know, Mike Thomas doesn't come here to, he comes here to help coach. You know, I see Eli Apple out there talking to Damon Arnett. I think that's a big part of what separates us from a lot of places. Those kids all come back with the ownership. Taylor Decker's here for a lot of reasons: one, to lift and train, but also to uh, help uh, Isaiah Prince and Jamarco Jones. That's when you got a good pro. That's when you know you got a, a good thing going. Zeke was out here the other day, and he was spending time with Mikey Weber and Briante. When you uh, you talk, touched on the injuries, and that's kind of made it hard for you to put together maybe that depth chart the way you want. Have, have replacing those nine guys and the seniors has that been more of a challenge than you anticipated, or is it going smoothly? How how do you evaluate that? No, I anticipated an issue. You know, the, what I did anticipate is the eleven guys that were counting on not playing. You know, I didn't know we'd have four receivers not go. I didn't know that. I kind of did, but you just don't even think that. Eric Smith and, you know, Cam Burrows would be limited. You know, I'm trying to think who else is. You know, Malik Barrow's not taking a rep all the, so far. So there's guys that we're really counting on that have not been able to for injury. So that's, it's, it's a thin, you know, you watch practice sometimes and you just kind of wince and like, oh, my goodness, you know, where, where are we going to be here? But I think we'll be okay with everybody gets healthy. Front row left, Mitch. Talk about the progress of the defensive line in the spring. Particularly that middle. Just okay. Just okay. I think, uh, I think Mike Hill's fighting through a, a nagging high ankle sprain. Um, the guys that are in the mix are Draymond, are uh, Jay Sean. Jay Sean so yeah, had a little uh, um, uh, midsection pull. He'll be fine. He just didn't practice much today because of the injury he had on Saturday, but he'll be fine. Um, Trying to think who else is in there. Um, Devon Hamilton has really improved. Landers has improved. So there's a lot of bodies, just not anyone stepping up to the forefront yet. Back row left, uh, Bill. Yeah, actually, the defensive line is my question. But Sam Hubbard in particular, has he been a guy? He's doing very well. Okay. Yeah, he's he's doing well. So was uh, Jalen Holmes, who really made a little bit of a push. Because Taekwon's another guy that we're counting on. It's not practicing at all. In terms of, of Sam, I mean, obviously he benefited from the extra attention that, that Joey got. He was a part-time guy. Do you think he can be a guy who could really emerge one of the next stars? Yeah, he has to be. Yeah. I really think he will, too. You, you figure his journey was from uh, he was recruited because of a dodgeball drill in Muller High School, and that's whenever that was, in January of whatever year. Then he went from being a safety or a lacrosse, excuse me, a lacrosse player to Safety to defensive line to tight end to defensive line. So he's he's really coming. What a great kid, great worker. Far left, Matt. <clears throat> At this stage of the spring, you've you know kind of turned the corner on or on the back half of the practices. Did, does it change what you're looking for? Or what what are you looking for at this point, like from these guys to finish? Well, that's a good point. We had a long discussion about that last year. Last week was about chaos. You have 3,000 students in there, loud noise the entire time, and screaming, yelling, and we on purpose try to create situations, environments. You know, this I'll probably shut down practice for everybody on Thursday and Saturday this week, just because I want it extremely quiet. I want to. We have to get better now, and find out we still have a hard time putting together our depth chart. So. Yes, to answer your question, we have done that. Has it been successful? You know, it remains to be seen. But every there's a theme to every week that we do around here. And the first one was install spring break. Next one was first and normal and, and just getting used to practice. Last week was creating as much chaos as we could throughout the week of practice to watch guys respond. And then this one, just because of where we're at, shutting it all down and finding out, you know, we have to make some hard decisions coming up here. This week, by Saturday, there's some guys are going to play and some not going to play. Yeah, Urban, speaking of that chaos and stuff, how, how do you like watch like video from Saturday and you see an individual offensive lineman just getting beat, just blowing up everything? And, and how, how do you, how do you as coaches make sense of that? Are you just looking at that individual battle, or are you looking at how Joe Burrow Great. responded? I mean, and, Great. this, this is a message we have with the team today. If you're not playing well, there's three, there's only three reasons. One, you're really a poor player, really, really bad football player. 
and that's usually an excuse because to make it to this level, you've done something very well. Uh, the uh, number two would be you're extremely poorly coached, and I try to watch that closely. Once again, to get to this level as a coach, you either been a, a complete uh, phony or somehow you got away with it. But I I don't see that. You know, I watch closely. I'm not saying coaches don't make mistakes, but that's my job. And then the third one, there's something wrong. You know, there's something wrong with the chemistry in your unit room. You know, there's something wrong with maybe your lifestyle. Maybe you're not getting your rest. Maybe you're not putting the right things in your body. Maybe you don't, maybe you shut off being Ohio State when you walk out the doors. He said, I'm, I quit thinking football. And uh, so that's our job to address that and find out. So it's only one of those three things. And 90 percent of, 90 plus percent of them are the last one. You know, why did Curtis Grant, why did Stevie Miller, why did all these kids play so great that last end of the last year? Because they fixed that number three, because they were always good enough, but they didn't play good enough. So you have to find out why. And that's a very complicated, and it's something we spend an inordinate amount of time on, to find out the why is that kid not playing. It's too easy to say, you stink. You're no good. You're no good. No, no, no they don't. They've done something very well to be here. And the reason I'm spending so much time on that, you just got this 20 minutes what we just spent with our team about. About what well, you have to find out that reason. And then you find out socially they're not doing what they're supposed to do. Maybe maybe they're putting something. Maybe they're doing something that young people and young and old people do that aren't conducive to being a major college football player. But that's our job to find out. It's too easy to say you're not good enough. We don't do that here. But youth, does youth factor in at that? I mean, is that sure? Is that a great excuse? excuse. Yeah. Sure, yeah. sure. Did you ever, when you were coming up and got into real football, did you ever play quarterback? Oh, uh, real football, no. What I'm asking is, when you stand there and watch that, though, in front of you and watch those guys. Which is years of experience, yeah. yeah. It's mean, the most comp It's, it's a, it, You have two seconds to do the things that those guys are asked to do. And I remember our, the Blue Jackets hockey coach came here one day. I don't think he's, he's not there anymore, but he came in. And a great guy. And he, I said, stand right here and watch what's happening. And I mean, phew, and he got two seconds. By the way, where would you throw the ball? He goes, yeah. so that's a very unique position. Darren Lee, four years ago, three or four years ago, I'm not sure y'all knew what he was going to be. But is he an example of, of nope. like you talk about, about taking a player and finding a way to use him as opposed to you? Spring got of 14 is when we found I, I mean, were you listening to our meetings today? Because Eli Apple had an iron deficiency. He couldn't finish a drill. It was uh, We were ready to say he's not good enough to play here. Darren Lee, Ezekiel Elliott was a very mediocre running back his freshman year. If you remember, just flip on the Purdue tape at Purdue. When he, we, he busts loose and he steps out of bounds after a 20-yard game, just just average as can be. Um, you know, Stevie Miller, Curtis Grant, Michael Thomas, Zeke Elliott, would like, like I just said, a bunch of average players that this was the spring in 14 where they showed up. We're not, you know, maybe they will show up because we still have a few more practices, but the acceleration's got to be there. We're not accelerating like we did. But you have a guy, in your opinion, who can play like y'all played Darren Lee. I mean, like, you know, I mean, because oh, yeah. y'all figured out a way. Yeah, Jerome Baker has a skill set. You know, I, the early's in first, but because he, he's had a little more anticipation. Doesn't have the same skill set, but he's early's a pretty good player. We got time for two more. One from uh, uh, Tony. Um, there's been a lot of talk about Austin Mack and, and Torrance Gibson this spring, but I'm wondering how the receivers on the other side of the field have done this spring. And how important is their development to the success of the season? Yeah, it's James Clark, it's Terry McLaurin, and it's Paris Campbell. Uh, K.J. Hills is the other guy, one of the 11 guys that can't practice because he's got to – he practices some. Uh, but those guys are doing pretty good. Paris is doing decent. Terry's doing decent. So James Clark's having his best spring. So those three are coming on. Uh, still not where we need to be. Johnny had his best scrimmage Saturday, the, probably his first scrimmage Saturday, and he did very well. So – wasn't as good today, but he, he at least is making some progress. Most of his is health related. And far left, Doug. Urban, in an ideal world, do you like to find the 11 guys you want to play, your 11 starters on yep. each side of the ball, and play them? Or in an ideal world, would you like to have so much depth that you do rotate? I know you rotate oh. defensive line, you rotate receiver. Kerry Combs was maybe talking about the idea of rotating some corners this year. Is that what you would like to do, or do you like finding these are our starters, let's go with them? No, I much. Someone asked about the quarterback situation and how terrible that was last year. I thought it was fantastic. You have two great players that you're, you know, so I, I much rather have enough there where you're having all constant meetings about who should start as opposed to the, the guy that number two is not near what number one is. Because if something happens to number one, you're, 
your team goes like this. So I think the, an the answer is real, real obvious for a coach is we'd rather have a lot of depth uh, answers and guys fighting for spots. Do you want your coaches to say maybe this guy's the starter, but I'm going to take him out in this series because this next guy behind him is almost just as good. Maybe that guy's getting a little tired. Like, is that? Do you want your position? Coach That's when you have like a great that? team. That's when you have a great, okay. great team. When you know that Raekwon McMillan's almost as good as Curtis Grant. That's when life is really good as a coach. You can say, okay, going in there, and it doesn't have a drop off.